Uh, so before we go on uh, with comments or questions, Rudy, Rudy has an announcement, very important, very important um, news announcement has just happened during the lectures. All right. Uh, I'm a Canadian, so this is very interesting to me. I just heard yesterday morning, or today morning, that the Canadian penny has been withdrawn from circulation. There are no more Canadian pennies as legal tender, and I don't know the exact uh, sequence whether you'll be entitled to exchange your pennies for nickels or dollars, but that's the situation. So if you want to, in Canada, from here on in, if you want to buy something for 99 cents, or 99 cents, or 97 cents, or 96 cents, Gone. It'll be either a dollar or 95. So it just shows that the value of the currency is shrinking rapidly, and we don't have to bother with that anymore. And 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 the <coughs> flip side or another side of this in the U.S., the nickel is still worth more because it's actually made from nickel, and the metal value is larger than five cents. So there's a business model being advertised on the internet: gather U.S. nickels under the radar screen and wait. Because at one the, point this will happen. The Canadian copper, the penny, was already diluted several years ago because yes. the original originally it was copper. But now <coughs> they diluted it with uh, I don't know what other metals. It zinc. still looks zinc. zinc. Yeah, it's the metal. It's, it's but it still looks like copper. So you have to know which year yeah. it was changed over because the uh, <coughs> one which they have discontinued just now was already a highly diluted yeah. one. Now. Uh, the same happened in the United States. The original U.S. copper penny was, uh, was, uh, was uh, if not pure copper, but highly uh, refined copper. Whereas they also, I think, diluted it with zinc. But they are losing money, on, as you said, both on the nickel, which is the five cent piece in the United States, and I think they're also losing money on the copper, uh, minting copper. Does anybody know what year the U.S. penny uh, substitute copper? 1982. 1982. 1982. In the U.K. it was 1991. I'm sorry? In the United Kingdom it was 1991. Same thing. Yeah. Well, by the way, with the, uh, just to add, with the nickels, there's a famous U.S. hedge fund manager, I think I want to say it's Kyle Bass, but I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. Just bought, or not just, I mean six or eight months ago, something like a tractor trailer truck full of pallets of nickels. <laughs> I mean, enormous, like millions of dollars in legal tender value worth of nickels. And he had to argue back and forth on the phone with the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. And eventually they said, well, it's legal, we have to do it. <laughs> and so he was renting a huge bank vault somewhere in Texas because the melt value. Forget what it cost them to make with minting and stamping and controls and inventories and shipping and production. This was at that time something like 6.9 cents each. And of course, he could buy them at 5 cents each. <laughs> so he's holding them basically, there's a free put option, right at 5 cents. And he's holding them against a higher nickel price when um, I don't know if it's legal to melt them down. <laughs> They can export them to another jurisdiction where they don't have that law and then do it. Uh, there are laws about the exportation of, of certain amounts of U.S. coins for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Waiting until it's demonetized and once it's demonetized. Then it's this sh clearly shows the advantage of paper money over... <laughs> Well, in Canada they phased out paper dollars a long time ago. In the U.S. they still hmm. do it, but only for prestige reasons. It, 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 it would create quite a bad publicity if the U.S. withdrew the uh, Washington uh, dollar. I, I can speak to that a little bit. It was controversial some years ago when they wanted to do that. It was perceived by the American Idol watching, basketball watching, American viewing public 
that this was lobbying by the vending machine companies. <laughs> and so we're not going to allow the, the special interest of the vending machines to control our monetary policy. That's how it was perceived. I think that, so that was, there was a big backlash against it. They also tried to introduce a variety of one dollar coins, but they made them uh, so similar in size to the quarters that they were not accepted. The, the public doesn't go for it. Yeah, the public didn't like it. No. Hooked on paper. Well, in Canada we have a meeker type of public, right? Because they uh, uh, embrace the loony with great enthusiasm. Yes? Do I have a minute to tell you the story of the loony? No. Okay. The, the Canadian, Royal Canadian Mint prepared the dyes and equipment to make this new Canadian dollar coin. And as you can imagine, this is fairly expensive work to prepare all these polished, nice surfaces and high speed presses and this. They lost the dyes. <laughs> they did what? They lost them. Oh. The Royal Canadian Mint, the new Canadian dollar stamping dyes were lost. <coughs> so don't ask me where they went, they disappeared. So new ones had to be created, and they chose the Canadian bird, the iconic bird, the loon, to put on the back of it. Well, from the loon comes the name loony. But loon also comes from lunatic. <laughs> so there's a play on this, and obviously the Canadians are meek, but they make fun of it. These are lunatics, and they make a coin called loony, and then the two-dollar coin is called the Toonie. Toonie, Toonie. <laughs> okay. So, um, is it questions, question, questions, or comments on the back of um, the morning lecture? I've got a, a slightly frivolous question, Professor. Um, if you if you say that the coin is, let's say valid within some tolerance, the gold coins, won't that just induce people to clip off, let's say, 0.1% as soon as it comes out of the mint? Because they know that the legal tender value will always be put onto it, as it were. Uh, well, the, actually there was a word for that, uh, because coin clipping is something they did in the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, it's too crude, and of course they introduced the milled edge. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and that pretty well put the coin clippers out of business. What they did more in more recent times is what they call sweating the coins. It means you put the gold coins in a bag, and then, <laughs> preferably with a machine, <laughs> Shake, shake. People are really clever. <laughs> you know, if given enough time, they're going to figure it out. At first it was done manually, yeah. but then of course they introduced machines. the kind of machines which you see in paint shops. When, <laughs> when, you, when you buy paint, or especially when you blend different colors, then they pour the different paints in one thing and then put it on a shaker. And then it's sh sh shaken until it becomes homogeneous. Now, the, they had machines like that, used to have. <laughs> and I don't know how, <coughs> uh, what the government could do about this, but obviously, uh, you know, uh, the real solution is something like uh, a plastic uh, case or cover or a bag. A plastic bag which is sealed with a stamp on it. Uh, the, the problem can be handled. I, I don't think this is an uh, ins insoluble problem. <laughs> Silly question. So, so that's the uh, <laughs> sweating, sweating the coins. <laughs> Maybe it's worth sweating coppers now. <laughs>
uh, tumble dryer and they put in some poker chips and a whole bag full of the paper money and let it run for an hour and then the money doesn't, nobody suspects it of being counterfeit if it's been heavily circulated. Yeah. Mm. Like blue jeans, yeah. made, <laughs> made so warm, yeah. artificially. Um, any, any comments or questions um, on the back of the morning's lecture? Peter? Okay, well, uh, I know there are some people who have studied the uh, post-trim business cycle as explained uh, in the Ludwig from Mies Institute. Their explanation of the business cycle is uh, based on credit abuse and fractal banking and the lowering of the interest rates would lure entrepreneurs into investments and misappropriation investments. Anyway, I think their explanation of the business cycle is more based on some kind of Marxist school of overproduction. This is the way I, I, I think they propose it. Whereas the Fullerton effect and the explanation based on the Fullerton effect for the business cycle is way more sophisticated. And I think I should point out that this is a major difference with the uh, traditional business cycle explanation. Yes, I think that a lot of people, when they say, hear the word Austrian, <laughs> Austrian <coughs> business cycle theory, they'll just say that credit is overextended and that eventually, but it's a bit more subtle, subtle than that, you know, so yeah. Brilliant. The real world example of this hoarding other stuff played out a couple of years ago in the palladium markets. Mm. Palladium prices were going to the moon. And why? Because the Ford Motor Company was buying physical palladium to put into the uh, exhaust system, the catalytic converters of their cars. And they kept buying and buying and buying. The price kept going up and going up and going up. And then they were sort of looked around and said, oh my god, we've got too much palladium, we'll never use this much. I started to sell it, and there was, this was in the news, how many dollars lost they took because of this hoarding and this hoarding palladium. Well, I actually spoke to the broker who dealt with Ford Motor Company for those transactions. I won't name the bank, but um, they said Ford Motor Company would call up the broker and say, why is the price of palladium going up so much? And he would turn around and say, because you're buying it. <laughs> <laughs> Christoph. I'd like to hear the professor's verdict on the Austrian business side of you. Well, um, <clears throat> I, I'm not really disputing the uh, <coughs> business cycle theory of uh, Mises and Hayek. Uh, because there, there's a lot of validity in it, and obviously that's what first happened. <coughs> uh, the, uh, the pushing interest rates down uh, was the wrong signal to the entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, producers, and uh, they were misled into false investments which looked profitable, but uh, because the uh, actual uh, producer goods were not available, only the paper signal, the interest rate, uh, was there, which you could not put into actual uh, products. So they were misled, and ultimately this fact has had to come to light, and when it did, then it created the uh, uh, market disruption, disruption, and that's how boom went into bust. I, I have no quarrel with that. This is a, a wonderful theory, and especially it explains how the thing started. But early on I started thinking about it. Well, I, I understand that you first were misled. But there is an English proverb which goes somewhat, somewhat like this. Uh, cheat me once, the blame is on you. Cheat me twice, the blame is on me. Which uh, really means that, uh, that uh, 
uh, we should have the intelligence of anticipating being cheated if we have been cheated once already because the, there was uh, an instance where we were cheated, we should have learned from it. We are human beings and we learn uh, from uh, our mistakes but also on uh, adverse uh, signals or uh, uh, malicious effects and so on. So, in other words, I am asking the question, are our entrepreneurs, are our <coughs> producers so stupid that they don't get wise to this, this very, very cheap trick of the banks pushing down interest rates and the government uh, helping them in, in, in doing and, and the whole, uh, the whole Accounting system is rigged because that you know this could not really uh, the banks could not get away with that if uh, the, the bank inspectors were doing their job properly and also the double standard which the government has because they have to have a double standard in other words contract law exists and it's applicable with the exception of the banks. Because if the banks do not perform as the contract calls for, then they have all kinds of ways out. They can, uh, in, under the gold standard, go off gold or suspend gold payments, or there was another nice name for Bank holiday. Bank holiday. You know, all kinds of euphemism covering up that actually there is a violation of a valid contract. But the contract law is not applicable because that's a bank, especially a favored bank, because there might be banks out of favor and they are allowed to go bankrupt. But the favored banks, and especially the central bank, can do, do what it wants. You wanted to say something? Well, I want to address this a little bit. Understand the signal is not something like a red or green light. It means interest rates are low. So there are business opportunities pre presented to you. So let's say you're smart and you understand this. You have a choice to take it or not. If you don't take it, you just sit tight. Other people will take it and beat you up. And you will not survive the day 10 years from now when it turns around. But the ones who took it and go in, they also beaten up. Because when they turn around, they get beaten up that way. So it's a lose-lose situation. Even if you know that it's a false signal, it's, it's, it plays out in the real economy. You don't have to convince me of how awesome is that fact theory. I think it's the single most important theory to understand the crisis. And, uh, it's, uh, and I would say, well, you might say they're stupid that they don't see it, but you know, nobody teaches them. I mean, in uh, mainstream economics, they don't know anything about uh, this awesome business uh, cycle theory. So in all the papers and everywhere something else is written, and entrepreneurs, you know, they are no social philosophers, you know, and, and, and reading uh, uh, Mises Hayek and company. Um, so uh, they they don't simply don't know they 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 think well that's the interest rate you know and they make a very rational calculation and it's worthwhile building a skyscraper at this rate of, uh, of interest you know and this is why you have the skyscraper index which <laughs> fits in here very well you know every, always when you see in some places of the world you know cranes all over the places and and uh, investments which even uh, 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 well, a long period of, of producing and, and high investments, like real estates, like building skyscrapers, like in the Asian crisis, uh, Asia crisis, or see Dubai, you know, and all these places. Then you can say soon there will be a bust, and that because and that they are over investing due to these false signals. And uh, once and that they, you know, they build like ten skyscrapers at twenty. Uh, uh, how is it? Stories, so uh, twenty stories, you know. And then the eighteen story, all all project at the same time discovered as as you just said, not enough, enough real stuff, you know, to produce this because they, this was just signals, paper signals, uh, so to say, you know. Mm -hmm. And then all these projects stop, and uh, the po uh, politics come in and, and decide these two projects will be finished, and the other one needs uh, to go bankrupt. Now. 
Today, uh, it's even more complicated. You know, in this magazine I gave you, we have an article called The Permanent Bubble. You know, this business cycle, which we have to, as long as we had, you know, a kind of uh, gold standard until 1978, it was, as we all know, not a real gold standard any longer, but still there was some, uh, um, as I say, some, some gold taxes still, you know. We had this in our business cycle, but since we got loose this, uh, uh, since uh, um, we have a, a pure fiat money system, you know, every uh, in every bus, you know, they can get into with new signals of, of cheap money, and so it's getting up, up, up and uh, to this permanent bubble we are in now for, for several decades. But even a permanent bu the bubble will, one day will burst, and this will be very, very low. Um, so that's that's my. I uh, just hold hold your question. I have not finished answering your original question, so give me a chance to finish it. <coughs> so I accept the uh, Mises Hayek theory of the business cycle, especially early on when this uh, these false signals first started and people didn't know. Uh, how to interpret them. But as time wore on, it became less and less convincing that uh, our entrepreneurs, our businessmen, are so stupid that they fall for the same cheap trick again and again and again, and they never learn from it. After all, we have all kinds of software and other ways of checking things, and uh, uh, so the entrepreneurs, before they act and make heavy investments just because the interest rate is low, they could run their own little research and check the validity of these interests. They don't want to walk into an open trap. Oh, but I, I, I don't think. What they know, if, if there's a learning effect, sorry. Okay, sorry, finish. <laughs> so I f felt the need of something more than just this, the Hayek-Mises theory, which, as I say, had great merit and so on, but it was not the full explanation. And that's how I came to this idea of uh, money, huge flows of money, really overwhelming, because as I suggested to you in my lecture, the, uh, you have to take this globally. If everybody is hoarding, or everybody is this hoarding, including housewives and, and consumers and producers and warehousemen and everybody without exception doing the same thing, now normally one would hoard and another would dishoard and they would cancel out. But because of the uh, situation as I explained it, the movement of hoarding and dishoarding is always in the same direction. And therefore the uh, flows, huge flows of money between the bond market on the one hand, the commodity market on the other, develop. And when money flows this way, from commodities to bonds, that's uh, deflation. And when it reverses and flows the other direction, it's inflation. I'm not suggesting that this theory is complete. But the idea, I hope, shows in the right direction that you have to do more research and study the details a little more closely that this is in fact what is happening. It's like a pendulum. And we know the pendulum will uh, ultimately uh, uh, stop because of friction and air resistance. But this pendulum keeps moving and sometimes even goes into the reverse because there is such a thing as, uh, uh, as uh, resonance, re uh, harmonic uh, frequency. As uh, mm, when, when the amplitude gets smaller, that's called damp. Dampening. Damp, damped uh, oscillation. oscillation. But 
we should realize that there's such a thing as the opposite, which is runaway oscillation. And a beautiful example of that is the uh, collapse of the Tacoma Bridge in Washington State, and the year was 1940. And this showed the, basically the bad design, the suspension bridge, but they did not take the gale force winds into uh, account. Not that a single gale force could make the bridge <coughs> collapse, but when the forces come in quantas, in packets, and the packets come with a frequency which is a harmonic of the uh, own frequency of the bridge, then these, these um, impulses do not dissipate. They get added, added, and added until the tolerance of the bridge is overwhelmed and the uh, cable snaps and the bridge uh, collapses and falls into the river. And this has been preserved on film. And you can film, well, you see that film. You just have to see it to believe it. It's fantastic. Now, what, I, what I'm suggesting <coughs> is that something like this could happen. Because as I say, n this is not a damped uh, oscillation. This could be a runaway oscillation. And, and uh, as I say, more research had to be done. I, I introduced another word. We already talked about this a little bit, uh, economic resonance. And the last lecture, uh, lecture 10, is going to come back to this problem. And I think that uh, uh, this addition to the original Mises Hayek theory of boom and bust is, is needed to make it a complete theory. That is what I'm suggesting, that is what I'm trying to put across. Yeah, I alluded to this yesterday when I said the response of the control circuit has to be faster than the resonance. And if it's not, then it falls behind, gets out of phase, and exactly this uh, build-up resonance happens. Mm. And when the Fed starts to put on the brakes, it's way too late. They're actually being counterproductive by these efforts because they're out of, they're out of phase with what's happening. But the real bills market responds in, virtually instantly. So before anything can get resonant, the response is there to, to bring it back. Boom, boom, boom. But if it starts to go out and out and, out, and then you start to come later, this has already started to shift. Mm. So you're adding to it. You know, like a kid on a swing. Mm. If you're in phase with this, you can swing like crazy. So this is one of the things that uh, prevent these cycles or keep them under control. And those signals have been cut. They're not fed back anymore. So. Yeah. Keith. I just had a few thoughts to share. Uh, first of all, Christoph, at one of my points, the uh, entrepreneur, the businessman, is not a philosopher nor an economist. He doesn't know why things are happening. He doesn't have any particular theory about why interest rates are falling. He obviously, if you ask him what was the interest rate in 1985, he's vaguely aware it was, well, it was probably higher than I think. But he doesn't really study it. He doesn't really look at the graph of TYX every day. You know, he just knows that in front of him is the price signal. And if he has any theories at all, it would be a wrong theory. It would either be the monetarist theory or the Keynesian theory. It sounds like a guy on a date. <laughs> right, he has some, he has some bogus yeah, notions it's right. that have nothing to do with reality and somehow manages to succeed in spite of that. Number two, he, un unfortunately today, he's used to living in an environment where the contract has no sanctity. His labor contract has no sanctity. There are labor laws that overrule that. In the state of Arizona, for example, it's considered a right-to-work state, which means you can lay off an employee for no cause. However, if you lay off an employee for one of a growing list of reasons, race, gender, sex, age, religion, uh, disability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then that is illegal. So you have the contradiction between it's legal to lay off for no reason, but illegal to lay off for one of these reasons. And on and on and on with, with prices and antitrust and there's you know permits and he's used to living in an environment where 
the uh, government has the arbitrary and capricious power to do things, and he just kind of says, well, okay, but in the meantime, there's an opportunity. The, uh, the third thing is that there's a, um, I think they call this the agency dilemma in economics. The individual at a large corporation is responsible for uh, making a business decision may have personal motives. That he may get a bonus for expanding the business, and he will be paid long before 10 years from now, when the cycle turns again and, and wipes out his company, mm -hmm. he's personally taken home enough money to become independently wealthy and retire for the rest of his life. And so there's so many, I mean, I, th I think the, the business cycle as proposed by Mises and Hayek makes sense as far as it goes, but I think there's so many other cross currents and undercurrents and dynamics in the market and the Fullerton effect uh, and the um, economic resonance, which the professor is we're talking about, I don't know if that's that tomorrow or Monday, and then Monday afternoon I'm talking about that as well. These are just more things to add to the, the edifice of theory that talks about these destabilizing cross currents that sometimes work against each other, sometimes work synergistically with each other, and the system becomes less and less stable over time. I think that overextending or the overextension of credit is a very simple and it's, it's a far too simple way of looking at it. The, the business cycle is natural in as much and so far as the resonance of a poorly constructed bridge is natural. You know, there is nothing inherent to why a business cycle should exist if maturities and durations across the financial system are matched. You know, so there's nothing inherent about the Kondratiev cycle or the Kondratiev observation. There's nothing inherent that the business cycle must happen. It's a function of having a poor construction in the first place. So that's why it requires much, much more work than Hayek or Mises did on it. Uh, may I ask well, the, the idea of the business cycle is, oh, is that Due to this artificial low interest rates, uh, which are an incentive for investing, uh, there is a disallocation of resources. That's, that's the fundamental statement of the business cycle theory. Uh, there are investments made uh, which wouldn't have been made if the market would be in rule. And these are investments and are which need a high, uh, um, lot of capital, for instance, house building. Now, um, these investments are made, and, and when the, uh, um, when, while, they are, while this process is ongoing, in the end, when the interest rate rises again, they have to default, you know, they, they, they go bankrupt. Now, this is what we, for instance, had uh, end of the 70s, when Paul Volcker came into office of, of the Federal Reserve, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, Jimmy Carter who was president, uh, uh, he, the first thing he did uh, was uh, how I say, to rise another interest rate. And this had exactly this effect, and that there was a recession, and Carter wasn't uh, uh, elected again, but Ronald Reagan. This is why politicians don't want it, uh, as you already have explained several times during this course, they want to have low interest rates and, so to say, cheap money. Now, this is why I mentioned you know, the permanent bubble, because if the businessmen have learned something, uh, professor, professor, it's not you know, that they, there will be a, you know, a recession, but what they have learned, if they have learned anything, government will step in and have with new fresh money. That's why this, and, and this only goes because nowadays we have a, a completely you know, fiat money system. If we still had a gold standard, there, there would have, uh, they, they, they would need a correction, or there would be a correction you know, by, uh, with a recession, and we would long have, have one. But uh, um, since they come again and again with new programs and, and, and cheap money uh, uh, due to the fiat money system, and uh, they can blow it up again and again, but at the very end, uh, it will default. And this is why I'm not very sure about, you know, will we have hyperinflation or, 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 or uh, speculation, but um, this, I, I tend to think that in the end there will be hyperinflation. And the single most important indicator is when the public loses uh, trust and, and um, uh, confidence into uh, yeah, the government bonds and, uh, and, and the, the fiat money. And when this happens, you know, 
everybody wants to get uh, 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 jobs with money, or, or uh, a lot of money chases a few reading <laughs> uh, uh, um, Yeah, no, I agree with you, but you, you have to go back. This is not black and white. Mm -hmm. When gold was still well in the system, and there was also credit in the system, this this thing that uh, you're talking about did happen, the signals. Mm -hmm. But today, there is no gold in the system, so yeah. it's completely loose. And exactly, not only are there false signals, they don't. nobody looks at that anymore. They look at what the Fed is going to say next. Mm -hmm. It's not the real market signals that count. It's like, did he say, for a very long term, we're going to hold this? interest rate or long term or is it 0.02% or 0.05% and when he makes the announcement the whole world shifts and this is completely wrong yeah, because all the national signals are ignored. Right? Oh, yeah. but oh. this, this doesn't mean that the that the ABCT is wrong the office well, is nobody said it, was it wrong. just says you know that it's, it's correct as long as there's still some gold uh, are, are there any other questions that anyone has um, because I think that we should, okay, yeah. you know, I'll have the last half sentence on this subject, okay? We're not denying your observation is inaccurate, okay? But no businessman I know would have his business go sub-marginal if the interest rate from 3%, interest rate went from 3% to 6%, okay? No businessman I know operates like that. You know, the tolerance for the interest rate rise will be much greater than that for any particular venture. It's more a question of the nature of the funding of the venture. Okay. It's, it's, it's it not, not the rates that you're paying. It's the, it's, the, it's the nature of how you're funding everything. If you're funding everything on a short-term basis, but your assets mature at a, on a, on a long-term basis, that is not something that Hayek and Mises talk about. Okay. So it requires further investigation, which I'm sure would make a great topic for a uh, master's or bachelor's degree, and I think that's where we'll put uh, the lid on it, okay? So, are there any other questions uh, that anyone might have about today's proceedings? No, Professor? No questions. I think we'll call it lunch then. Thanks very much, Professor.